Welcome to this forum for candidates for Pierce County Council. I'm Liz Kernitz Thurlow, the moderator, and on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Tacoma Pierce County and all of our co-sponsors, I welcome all to this virtual forum. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization whose mission for the past hundred years has been to encourage the informed and active participation of citizens in government. Therefore, candidates forums. Any person at least 16 years of age may become a member of the League. And for membership information, go to our website, www.tacomapiercelwv.org. <clears throat> this forum is, we are co-hosting this forum with the Tacoma Pierce County Affordable Housing Consortium. I would now like to turn it over briefly to the chair, Michael Mira. Thank you, Liz. My name is Michael Mira, and I would like to add my welcome to the candidates. The Affordable Housing Consortium is a membership organization of all the organizations and people interested in affordable housing. It includes the private and nonprofit and public organizations that develop it, own it, manage it, the mainline banks that finance it, the architectural firms that design it, the construction companies that build it, the supportive services organizations that um, support the people who live in it. Pierce County is a member, City of Tacoma is a member, and a number of individuals, all of whom share the interest in Pierce County's ability to create and preserve affordable places for its residents to live. For this reason, we're pleased to co-host this candidates forum on housing topics, and we're grateful to the candidates for your willingness to participate. Thank you. Thank you. So today's forum is for candidates for Pierce County Council Districts 4 and 6. The general election is Tuesday, November 3rd. Even more than usual, between an expected very heavy voter turnout and possible problems with the post office, you are encouraged to vote early. And using our ballot drop boxes rather than the mail seems like a good idea. Hmm. The candidates for County Council District 4 in ballot order are Ryan Mello, and Javier Figueroa, who was unable to attend. For District 6, the candidates are Jenny Hitchin and Jason Whalen. Welcome all of you. We're thrilled Thank that you're you. able to participate. Um, as we're co-sponsoring this with the Tacoma Pierce County Affordable Housing Consortium, most of the questions will primarily deal with housing and homelessness. As some of the issues are very complicated, unlike our usual format of preparing questions and accepting questions from viewers, the candidates have received the questions in advance. Warning, I'm changing some of them a little and adding one or two, and you don't know what order they're going to be in. To our audience, of course, there are other issues as well. Read the voter's guide, check vote411.org, read candidates' websites, and either call or email them. Ask your other questions. Our timekeeper is Terry Baker from the League of Women Voters, which come with Pierce County, and she will let the candidates know when they need to stop and as, as time goes on. Candidates, please remember to stay in view so you can see me and Terry. So each candidate has up to two minutes for an opening statement. These will be given in ballot order. After that, the order of answering questions will rotate and all candidates will be asked all of the same questions. Remember while listening that there are two different Pierce County Council seats here. So only two of the candidates will appear on your ballot. And at the end, closing statements may be up to one minute and will be in reverse ballot order. So for District 4, your opening statement, please, Ryan Mello. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, at least it's evening as we tape this. Thank you to the League of Women Voters uh, for making a, another great opportunity for voters to hear directly from candidates and Thank you for the Affordable Housing Consortium for your incredibly thoughtful work, not only tonight to educate voters about critical affordable housing issues, but the work you do year round to push for policies and educate policymakers. Affordable housing is absolutely one of the most pressing issues facing our community. And so I'm really glad we get to focus on these, these really core issues. And great to see my friends, Jenny and Jason, in a normal election year, we'd be able to see each other and give each other hugs, and we don't get to do that this year, so I'm missing that. Um, but I am Ryan Mello, uh, running for the Pierce County Council, District 4, 
which does represent a good part of Tacoma, uh, downtown, the port, Hilltop, Central Tacoma, South Tacoma, and then all of Fircrest and all of University Place. I've spent 10 years on the Tacoma City Council um, and five years on the Metro Parks Tacoma Board. Um, so I have 15 years of policymaking experience and also making our community better. I've uh, led and budgeted in very difficult times um, and really good times. So um, fortunately or unfortunately, I have the experience of what it takes to, to lead in a down economy and it looks like we're gonna need that. Uh, those that background, unfortunately. Um, professionally, I serve as the executive director of the Pierce Conservation District, where we work every day to protect the natural resources right here at home. Um, that's our water, our air, our soil, our habitat for salmon and other fish, and the places we play. Um, I want to bring my uh, work um, values and priorities of making everyday people's lives better um, that I have really honed on the Tacoma City Council to the Pierce County Council to work on these really pressing issues um, regionally. So I'm, I'm looking forward to our discussion this evening. Thanks again. Thank you. In District 6, the first candidate on the ballot is Jenny Hitchin. So thank you very much for hosting this event. Um, I very much appreciate the work of the League of Women Voters and, and their efforts to make sure that voters are educated um, and for the Housing Consortium for bringing some really fantastic and thoughtful questions. I really appreciated the exercise of going through those and thinking hard about what I would do in, in this position and what kinds of, of things I need to learn and what kinds of things that um, I would bring to the table. So I appreciated that. So I am Jani Hitchin. I'm running for Pierce County Council District 6 which would represent Lakewood, Silicon, Tillicum, Anderson Island, Ketron Island, um, DuPont, a part of Tacoma, a part of Parkland, and Joint Base Lewis-McChord. So it's a small district. Um, and we are um, really excited about the work that we're going to undertake here. But one of the reasons I'm running is I'm not a typical candidate. I'm a high school science teacher that's been very active in my union, working to get pro-family, pro-community, um, pro-environment candidates elected kind of behind the scenes and through my efforts with my union. And I found that I really wanted to see leadership that could listen and speak with people and be approachable. And the people that I helped campaign for were that and continue to do that work at the state level um, and even going federal. And it's, and it's that approachability they think is important. And so one of the reasons I'm running is that my skills in the classroom, my ability to problem solve and to work with others and communicate effectively makes me approachable, but it also makes me someone who people trust and somebody who brings something to the table that's something kind of just a little different. So I hope to bring my voice and my energy and my work ethic to Pierce County Council District 6 and the council as a whole. So thank you for putting this on this evening. I appreciate it. Thank you. The other candidate for District 6 is Jason Whalen. Your opening statement, please. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. It is great to see all of you here. I have uh, had the opportunity to interact with many of you over the course of time, and I very much appreciate this opportunity provided by the League of Women Voters to talk about these important conversations that we need to have as a community, uh, not just in the city of Lakewood, where I've served for the last 11 years as a policymaker, but regionally here in Pierce County. Uh, these are critical times, and coming out of, of COVID-19, uh, the economic downturn that we've suffered recently in our community, these are serious and challenging times that I believe uh, require a steady hand and skilled leadership. And what I would like to uh, stay briefly, stay briefly in the opening statement is a little bit about my background and why I'm running. Uh, my background as a lawyer in downtown Tacoma spans 28 years working with small individual family and business owners, uh, many of whom uh, are involved in the housing industry, whether as developers or as landlords or as tenants. And so I'm familiar with the issues that many face, but also as a policymaker for the city of Lakewood, where I've served as a council member and now deputy mayor for the last six of my 11 years there, we have experienced many of these challenges in our community and we're working with many of these issues in collaboration with our county partners and with our other partners, such as the city of Tacoma with our home and consolidated plan uh, monies. 
As a veteran, I also understand the needs of our community in terms of our soldiers uh, and military members at Joint Base lewis McCord, and those issues are unique to veterans. I believe I understand those challenges. What I hope to bring through our conversation today and on the campaign trail is some understanding that the skill set I bring is not that of a career politician, but a career problem solver, not only as a policymaker for many years now, as an attorney, but also as a mediator in Tacoma, working to resolve conflict. That is a skill set I believe that will work uh, handily with others uh, that will make it to the county council. And I look forward very much to working with them to wrestle with these challenging issues. And so I thank you for the opportunity to speak to them tonight. Thank you. Thank you all. Now we come to questions. Um, this is being recorded five weeks before the election. So if you're watching later and there are new 2020 crises, we don't know about them yet. We don't want any more. Yeah, we've had plenty. <laughs> okay. Um, each of you will have the same amount of time to answer each question. You do not need to use all of your time. We're going to start with 90 seconds each. Question one will be answered by Jenny Hitchin first. Racial inequity is definitely an issue among those experiencing homelessness. As a county council member, what would you do to address racial inequity in housing and other issues? So I believe that one of the things that we need to be looking at right now is are there any policies or are there anything, um, any reasons why it's going on? And one of the areas that I find uh, that we find this being an issue is when we improve communities, we gentrify them is the term and we push communities of color out. And so we're doing it to make it better, yet we're displacing the people that have maybe been there for a decade or 50 years. And um, without really allowing them the dignity to be involved and figure out how can they stay in their homes um, where they've lived for that long and then allow the area around them to improve. And so I think as a county and as a county leader that we need to be very intentional that if we are improving an area that we're not just choosing an area that's poor and then fixing it up so that people who are wealthy can, can go in and buy the new thing. We need to be very intentional about making sure that's not happening. And we have lots of property in our community that could be fixed and cleaned up and be put to use that would not displace communities mm -hmm. of color that um, are finding that to be their areas under attack with that idea of gentrifying and improving. So I would like to look at that first and foremost as a county council person. Thank you. Jason Whalen. Well, I think we have to take a good hard look at our structural inequities that have uh, persisted over a long period of time we do have some institutional racism that we need to address. And I think uh, going back to the early 30s and 40s here in Pierce County in the city of Tacoma, there were covenants at play that restricted the ability for uh, members of our community of color to live in certain neighborhoods. And that has created over time, I believe, a gap in wealth for our uh, racial minority communities. And I think that is something that we need to continue to work very hard to overcome. In Lakewood, where I serve and where I live, Lakewood is one of the more diverse communities in our entire Pierce County region. It is probably one of the most diverse communities in terms of our black and brown communities, as well as our Asian residents and any number uh, of minorities of color. And we still hear, as best as our efforts have been, still have inequities uh, with regard to homelessness. And I think we have to work collectively to get best efforts and best ideas across both aisles to serve our communities better. And I think outcomes like tonight's conversation will help all of us understand better uh, how we can achieve more equity with our racial minorities to ensure that all members of our community, whether black and brown community members, white community members, Hispanic, uh, Native Americans, if they're experiencing homelessness, we owe them a duty to bring the best tools and the best thoughts to bear to address the situation. So 2021 and beyond will be better for all of us. Thank you. Ryan Mello. Well, um, you know, I'm going to represent uh, the Hilltop of Tacoma on the uh, Pierce County Council, like I did on the Tacoma City Council, uh, the largest population of uh, African American members of our community in the state of Washington. Um, and so that's one example where we are seeing gentrification happen in real life. 
Um, thank goodness there are organizations like Tacoma Housing Authority and Michael Mira, who leads the Tacoma Housing Authority, who is who really saw this coming and is has worked for years now and continues to work to get ahead of that. So get buying blocks of properties that might be blighted today and then reinvesting in them and then making sure that we can rent them as affordable units and really prioritizing people of color. Th that strategic work of Tacoma Housing Authority, um, really, really amazing and strategic work. They figured it out. Let's resource them. We don't got to go figure out a new brand new idea. Tacoma Housing Authority has figured this out. As policymakers, we need to resource the people who know what they're doing. And Tacoma Housing Authority is one of those folks who know what they're doing. The other issue is generational wealth that Jason mentioned, right? Um, there's disproportionate um, a lack of generational wealth. Our white counterparts uh, were able to um, inherit uh, houses and estates from their, from their families. Our African-American and, and brown communities didn't have that generational, uh, generational wealth um, opportunity. Um, so we need to fix that with helping with down payments and other ideas to improve generational wealth. Thank you. Okay, Jason Whalen will answer the next question first, and this one was not sent to you. <laughs> a report to the County Council recently said that Black people are arrested at a disproportional, disproportionate rate in Pierce County and focused on policies and practices that disproportionately affect people of color. Public Review Committee is being formed to examine policing, housing, and other policies which disproportionately affect people of color. What do you hope for what the committee and then the county council can accomplish? I am very hopeful uh, with regard to this report because it is a great first step at getting a hold of data, real data, that we can recognize uh, a problem in our community because the data reflects in our criminal justice systems and perhaps all of our institutions that we have disproportionate impact to our communities of color, especially our black and brown communities. What I am hopeful about is the composition of the committee. There is an incredible group of people that are reviewing this data and the conversation is being facilitated by retired judge Frank Cuthbertson. I have the utmost respect and admiration for Judge Cuthbertson. I have been in front of him in his courtroom on numerous occasions over the last 20 some odd years that I've been practicing law here in Pierce County. He is an eminently fair scholarly man that will really help facilitate a conversation to the wider community. So I am very hopeful that this is the beginning of a very in-depth conversation that will lead to concrete strategies, goals, and measurable results. And I look forward to being part of it. Thank you. Ryan Mello. Well, um, incredibly serious uh, question in front of us. And uh, I, I definitely agree that we need to go where the data follows us. Um, we know the data says that black and brown, uh, our black and brown neighbors are um, stopped more, arrested more, charged more, prosecuted more, um, and uh, put away at, for longer sentences for similar crimes than their white counterparts. Absolutely disproportionate impacts. We need to understand that data. Why is that happening? Um, in addition, to um, just acknowledging that racism is alive and well in our community, but we need to uncover that um, and really understand uh, why that is happening. Um, like Jason said, there is a community panel of, uh, I consider them community experts, um, who are gonna be, un who are uncovering the specifics behind this data. Very similar to the community panel of experts we have on affordable housing right. and mental and behavioral health. We have really smart people in this community. And I think we need the political courage to take the hard work um, of these various panels that policymakers put in place, have the political courage to do the tough work to um, implement the policies and resource those policies. That hasn't happened all the time, especially with mental and behavioral health as one example. But again, these folks are so smart who have the answers. It's our job as policymakers to have the political courage to take the tough votes, uh, explain why it matters um, to other policymakers and to the community, and to give the financial resources to make it so. So that's what I'm committed to doing. Thank you, Jenny Hitchin. 
So we know that we have institutional racism. This report just provided one more piece of evidence um, that our community is, is hurting from this. And so I think we need to be working with the data that's been gathered, with the experts that have been brought forth and tasked with this. But as a county council, we have to make sure that once we've started this work, that we continue the work that we do the actions that they call us to do and that we support it. Because if we don't, the unacceptable will happen in my view, that we will go back to the way things were. We need to find and eliminate anything that is institutional racism within our county. And that is gonna take really hard, really hard conversations with people because people tiptoe around the issue. We need to call on these people to help educate people who are white, who don't know, and are uncomfortable in talking about it and educate them and move them for them. It's, it's courageous conversations. We need to talk and learn and grow because that's the only way we're actually going to move beyond this as a community. And it's gonna take these experts and it's gonna take some time and it's gonna take some money. And that all comes by being pushed by our county council. And if they s drop the ball and don't follow through, we will go back to the way things were, and that is not okay. Thank you. Uh, Ryan Mello is first for this one. What should be the county's role in addressing its shortage of affordable housing for low-income residents? Well, I think the county's role needs to be um, one of a very productive uh, partner. I think the, the county has an important role to uh, continue to be a convener the county has an important role to uh, make sure that we continue to put policies in place that uh, encourage the development of permanent affordable housing where that growth makes sense. I don't think growth for growth's sake everywhere to the, to the bottoms of Mount Rainier makes sense. Um, there's a way to grow and provide more affordable housing in a thoughtful way. Um, that so that's all policy zoning and land use that the council the county has full control over and the county has a very important role in resourcing affordable housing so as a convener um, we can continue to convene all the cities and towns and county government to make sure that we are aligned in our strategy about how we grow where we grow um, and the, the various strategies that have been, we have, we have studies and plans ad nauseum. We don't need another study. We need to implement the, the affordable housing plans as an example. Um, and, and as a resourcer, the county has access to financial resources. Um, I know we're gonna talk about this more later tonight and I'm excited to get more specific about the financial resources the county needs to, needs to put in place to um, invest in uh, affordable housing, the building of affordable housing with affordable housing partners. Thank you. Jenny Hitchin. So my belief with um, the idea behind affordable housing is that we have, I think it is tied in part to um, generational wealth, which I think both Jason and Brian have brought up, um, but we don't have enough of it in our county. I think that that is the issue that we need to be addressing as a county is how do we increase our number of homes available that are considered affordable. And one of my concerns is always who gets to decide what is affordable. Um, because if it's 80% of the average median household um, that that might not be affordable for quite a few people in our county just based on um, what we see as far as the average income in our county. And, uh, and so I believe that we need to be working as a county to support uh, anything that's gonna increase the number of units. Uh, we're over 10,000 units short and we need to be working on making sure that um, we are doing the work as a county between the different organizations we need to be building in places where people can access housing and transport. And it's very important work. Um, I think it's one of the number one things that we should be focusing on because quality of life is directly tied to having you know, a home that's stable, that you have that housing stability. It really helps families, it helps students, it helps communities. And so we can be doing that as a county. It's just not being done well right now across the county. We need to do it everywhere. Thank you. Jason Whalen. 
Thank you. The, the question uh, as to what is the county's role in addressing the shortage of housing, I'll answer it in two ways. First, I think the county must acknowledge the gravity of the situation. Washington is the eighth fastest growing state in the United States. The Puget Sound Regional Council has provided new growth projections as a result of its work on Vision 2050, which is our regional growth plan. The Puget Sound Regional Council has projected that there's going to be 1.8 million more residents coming to the state of Washington. Pierce County is expected to take 21% or 265,000 new uh, residents as part of that growth. 38% will go to the large city like Tacoma. 23% will go to core cities like Lakewood, Puyallup, and uh, University Place. The rest is going to go to the county. In the urban areas of the county, we have to, number one, recognize the growth is coming. That's step number one. Step number two, the county has to be the convening authority on a regional basis to ensure that all the players are coming to the table and to look from top to bottom at a wholesale re review of what we have by way of tools, what have worked, what have not worked, what can work better. The Burke study that you provided gives an excellent outline of some of the tools in play. And I'm also very excited that we now have in place the South Sound Housing Affordability Partnership, which consists of the executive and the mayors of the cities within Pierce County. They have met and they are working on the issues. And I'm proud to say those issues include acknowledging and analyzing the local housing affordability data and needs. The tools that we'll talk about later tonight are part and parcel to the solution. Thank you. Because we have lots of questions, they're all about housing, we're now gonna only give you 60 seconds to answer. And Jenny Hitchin will be first on this one. So what should be the county's role in addressing its shortage of shelter and services for residents who are experiencing homelessness? So um, first and foremost, we need more and we need them in other areas than our urban centers. Um, we end up I, essentially shifting homeless from one community to another. And anytime you uproot someone who is homeless or families who's homeless, they may have supports there that are trying to, it could be a family member, it could be a friend, it could be a church. And if we move them to a shelter in another area of our county where, and they don't have transport, they're disconnected. So we need more shelters across our community. Um, in addition, I think one of the biggest thing is I would love to really sit down and, and sit with some smart people and figure out how do we provide supports to keep people from becoming homeless? What do we need to do to be intentionally keeping them from moving from a stability, um, the stability of home to a unstable situation where they're going from one home to another, couch surfing is what we call it for our students, um, or if they're in their car. And if we could keep that from happening, um, it's, way, it's far more cost effective to keep them in their homes than to move them from one place to another. Thank you. Jason Whalen. It's a big question for 60 seconds, but I'll attempt to do what I can. So uh, the word of the day is collaboration. Examples of collaboration in Lakewood included my work with Michael Mira when he worked uh, for Tacoma Housing and I was working for Lakewood Area Shelter Association, where we worked collaboratively and leveraged funds, including funds from the city of Lakewood, to create an opportunity for additional beds for housing, transitional housing and more permanent housing in Lakewood. That's an example of collaboration. Lakewood, for example, as well as other cities, in invests over 1% of its general fund annually to social service providers. We leverage those dollars with the experts in the field to provide uh, housing services, support services, and certainly mental health and behavioral health services in the city of Lakewood. That's over $750,000 in the next biennium, several million dollars over the last 10 years. Pierce County is going to have to do the same thing with its member and regional cities. We're going to have to work together to create regional leverage to maximize the utility of the funding we have and can use to increase shelter beds and transitional shelter and housing within the region. And I, I'm confident we can get there. We just need to be mindful of the leverages, the word of the day with collaboration. Thank you. Ryan Mello. Um, you've heard good thoughts already from Jenny and Jason about the need to provide services throughout the county, not just um, in one part of the county um, that has provided resources historically, like the hilltop of Tacoma. We need to provide we need to provide these services um, throughout the county. 
And so I'll spend my time in uh, two other brief thoughts. One is we have work to do to stop homelessness to begin with. It's much cheaper and more humane to um, preclude someone from getting homeless to begin with. So sometimes someone is, you know, they, they lose their job because they couldn't get their car to work or those tires were too expensive that, that uh, were flat. And so they can't get to work and then they end up homeless. So by helping that person um, fix their car, we prevent homelessness. That's, that's just one example. There's a lot of examples like that. Um, and providing deep wraparound services at these shelter facilities throughout the county. We've learned in Tacoma that when we, when we deliver deep, meaningful wraparound services, not just a, roof, a clean roof for their head, but wraparound services to help them find that job or get their license or get out of the DV situation, that's when we lift someone out of um, homelessness. Thank you. Okay, in 2019, the county received a report it commissioned from Burke Consulting. That report analyzed and recommended affordable housing policies and funding options. You received a link to that report. In addition, the League of Women Voters has produced a study on affordable housing shelter in Pierce County, and you also received that one. So please offer your views with reasons of the following and how you think improvements to our current system might be made. Jason Whalen is first. The recommendation to provide consistent, clearer, and more effective financial incentives for private developers to include affordable housing in their market rate mix. Well, with regard to that, I was pleased to see the Burke report pinpoint the fact that Pierce County does have incentives, financial incentives and fee waivers that are available. Uh, the fact that the Burke report indicated the low hanging fruit is we don't educate the development community adequately on what available incentives there are. So certainly we can do that. And I think that we can do certainly a better job of providing more stable budgeting for it. Uh, as you know and noted in your report, the Senate passed last year uh, what's called the 1406 monies. And those monies, Lakewood deferred taking uh, an extra step of those monies, deferred to the county because we know regionally we'll have more resources. We can leverage those monies to backfill the available fee waivers to provide more consistency in our annual budgeting so that developers can know if we target as a community, hey, we want to develop 250 additional housing units this year, in fee waivers, that's going to cost X, and we're gonna to commit to putting that amount of money through 1406 monies or others toward that pot. If there's consistency, it's communicated well, the development community is educated about it, I think we can make great progress. Thank you. Ryan Miller. I really do think that this is a, a really logical and practical place we can make a difference. And, uh, and we need to make a difference in educating um, those who are developing housing way on the front end, right? Not when they come in for a development permit um, at the development center in Pierce County. That, that's when the project is well on its way. It's when they're even conceiving of the project. We need to educate them about the various tools. You, you know, in, in Tacoma, as an example, we uh, have um, two incentives to stimulate uh, growth in our growth centers. One is an eight-year property tax abatement and the other is a 12-year. And if you use the 12-year abatement, you have to put in affordable housing. We saw developers not taking the 12-year over and over and over again. And so we asked ourselves, why is that? We asked our staff to talk to the development community. And it turned out that there was a lot of misconceptions about what what developers need to do in terms of reporting and what it took to use the 12 year after they were educated and things were more clear, more and more developers started to use the 12 year because it was a lot less mysterious and a lot less onerous when they were educated. And so I think this is a great uh, recommendation. Thank you. Um, and yes, you would be given more time, except there's a lot of questions. So some things are going to cover the same thing again. So you'll get your points in. Jenny Hitchin, please. Um, so as I was reading through the Burke report and the, um, the, the report produced by the League of Women Voters in partnership, um, one of the things that um, jumped out at me was the, the inconsistencies came up, like where they said the, the rules for this group in this area was okay, but if you moved over here, it wasn't okay. And when you have inconsistencies and you have people that are applying for permits or applying to, um, for, um, to work in certain areas, 
it's risky. There's a lot that can go wrong with developers when they're trying to do things. And, and most of them have the best intentions and want to follow the rules and follow and finish a project. Um, but if there's inconsistencies, things can get a little wonky for them. There's, they get in trouble. And so it makes, that, it makes it riskier for them. And so when we're talking about for-profit and nonprofit organizations, anything that we can do to make things clean and clear and consistent across the county, but it kind of goes back to the education piece as well. We need to be being very intentional about that so that people are willing to take that risk, and especially our nonprofit organizations. We want to make sure we're supporting them every way we can. Thank you. Okay, Ryan Mello will be first. The next one to comment on is the need for more flexibility on zoning and design requirements for affordable housing developments to make them less costly to build. Yeah, um, in the Burke report, they uh, talked about this idea, especially as it relates to um, plan, what, what are called in planned residential developments in the county code where you're platting out a, a number of homes at once. Um, you know, th this makes sense to me. The private sector is very, very creative. Um, now, there needs to be uh, boundaries on things. We need to protect everyone's quality of life and we need to protect our natural resources and the intent of community plans, but I truly believe that there are ways to um, really release the creativity and power of the private sector um, and just say, show me, okay, you, you have another way to get to the finish line. It still meets the intent of the community plan here and isn't gonna hurt anyone else. And we get a few more units and guess what? A bunch of them can, can be affordable. Well, show me, we, we need to be more flexible um, because there are some really bright people out there um, who I think can, can tackle these problems. Um, they're paid to tackle these problems in a lot more innovative way. And we need to take advantage of, of their creativity. Thank you. Jenny Hitchin. So one of the things that I look at when um, I'm thinking about this as far as zoning and is urban sprawl. Um, I live in an area of my district that is perfect, I think, for um, doing the work that needs to happen to increase our, um, our density. But we need the infrastructure in place to make sure that we can move the people in and out and that the people that are lived there have a voice so they don't feel, so it's kind of like, we need to make sure that the voice of the people that are already there is heard, but we need to make it better for them as well. And, um, and so I wanna make sure that when we talk about zoning, that it's not just let's build as far as we can, as, as much as we can. It absolutely with zoning comes down to intentional, where can we have this growth happen? And where does it make the most sense? And where is the quality of life for the people that already live there or going to live there be improved with this? We know we need housing, but it just can't go anywhere. It, it, we have to be intentional. I think that is what needs to happen. So there's flexibility, but there's not just an open season on Pierce County. Thank you. Jason Whalen. Uh, thank you. As I understand the question, it is how do we best increase housing units, recognizing the need for flexibility in zoning and design requirements? And my answer briefly is yes. Uh, we need to increase housing units. And the way we can do that in part is to have flexibility with zoning and design requirements. Here are some examples. For example, in Lakewood, we developed planned development districts in our code. We also enhanced the opportunity to have accessory dwelling units in every residential zone in the city, which allows for smaller housing units for a population that really needs that affordable housing. And we also passed a very unique cottage housing ordinance that allows in every residential zone to have smaller size homes that are perfect for the senior or new home buyer population to have homes of their choice of a size that they can afford. In terms of design requirements, uh, in Lakewood, for example, we developed a downtown sub area plan that made it easier for developers to not have to go through the SEPA process, the State Environmental Protection Act process. They can take the code book off the shelf, point to a piece of dirt that they're intending to develop and they get all the design criteria in one easy identifiable package. It is streamlined development and it makes it much easier with increased density in that zone. Thank you. Um, all of you need to make sure everybody you know watches this because that you're giving us so much information. So thank you. Jenny Hitchin will be first. And this one is please comment on the recommendation that the county donate, lease, or sell its surplus land for affordable housing development. 
Um, so I really thought that was an excellent recommendation. Um, not all of it, maybe all at once. I mean, I just, I think that we need to look at what's available and what's going to make sense and where it's located. So if we donate land that's out in the middle of nowhere and there's no access to transportation, that's not going to help us with low income housing because they need access to transportation. So I think looking at properties that could really um, work with the idea of density and work with the idea of access to resources and support systems that are in place. Um, I think that again, intentional planning is what I'm looking for. And so I find the idea of the county using land that's just not being used um, for something that is going to make the quality of life for people that live in Pierce County better. It, it for me was a no brainer. It's, it's just what it should be doing. Thank you. Um, Jason Whelan, please. Well, I think it's a fine idea. I think we have to look at the parameters of the legalities of, uh, of uh, utilizing uh, public funds for private purposes. So we really have to make sure that there's a public housing component to that, that question. But I can tell you, it's an awesome way to leverage uh, public funds and perhaps some public lands in partnering with other organizations like Tacoma Housing, but also Habitat for Humanity. In Lakewood, we have successfully used our code abatement and enforcement actions as well as the leverage of funds of CDBG and home funds to partner with Habitat. And in Lakewood, we've built 41 homes in partnership with Habitat in the Telecom neighborhood of the city. And we are putting more funds in the next biennium to build another house, uh, another nine housing units uh, in partnership with Habitat for Humanity. So that's an example of not quite using public land, Lakewood land, but using public resources in conjunction with public tools to make those lands and resources available for a development partner like Habitat. It has been incredibly successful for Lakewood. Thank you. Ryan Miller. You know, it's pretty uh, interesting actually when you, when you look at a map and see how many parcels Pierce County government owns. Um, just by operating the government, right? Um, expanding sewers, expanding roads, just going about the business of serving the public, the county acquires parcels some bigger, some smaller, all over the place. Um, and as has been mentioned earlier, we, not all of those parcels are appropriate for housing. Some of them are appropriate for flood control or maybe putting a, a future farmer on them so they can start their own business. Um, some properties may very well be appropriate for housing. So where matters, absolutely. Um, and uh, you, you know, in, in Tacoma, um, we did just this. There's, there was a big piece of property across from the health department on Pacific Avenue and about South 38th Street being laid you know, fallow for years. Um, come to find out it owned by the county, pretty big piece of property, um, five, 10 acres. And you know, we asked our staff to get to work with county government to see what we could um, put in place there that worked with the neighborhood. So uh, that's one local example. And I think there's many others. I hope so. Okay, uh, Jason Whalen will be first on the next one. The Burke Report acknowledges a limitation in its recommendations because they're focused on households at 80% of area median income. It states that different actions and strategies <clears throat> excuse me, are needed to support the development of housing for households with lower levels of income, of which alas, there are many. What different actions and strategies do you favor to serve those lower income residents of Pierce County? Well, I think the key component of that discussion in the Burke Report was with regard to private uh, development. How do we move the ball with the available tools to make sure that the rate of return for private development is not in the three to four percent range? Because as the Burke study indicated, private developers are really looking for their risk reward to get eight to nine percent at a minimum uh, cash on cash return to make a development pencil. So with the Burke Report, it looked at the different tools and strategies, including an analysis in how do you uh, move the needle to achieve housing for the 80% AMI versus the 30% and, and perhaps even the 20%. And it requires a thorough analysis of how best to use the available tools with consistency, better education for the development community, but certainly in partnership with the development community, so we can make a project that is serving 30% AMI residents, we can still make it pencil with private development because we don't have all the resources necessary regionally to create uh, basically government funded 
uh, projects for 30% AMI without leverage and without partnerships. It just won't happen. Thank you. Ryan Mello. I think with the Burke report and certainly our experience um, diving deep into these issues in Tacoma have demonstrated is, you know, um, unfortunately, the private sector is probably not the right partner for housing below 80%. I think the private sector is absolutely the right partner for housing at 80% of the area median income, which is about $57,000 mm -hmm. um, and above market rate housing. The private sector is absolutely the right partner there. And there's lots we can do to serve folks who make $57,000 and more. And what the data tells us is folks who make less than $57,000, that's where we need the most help and, the, and many more units than are available on the marketplace right now. And the data tells us that it, it, it takes subsidies. I, and maybe folks don't want to hear this, but it takes public subsidies to make those kinds of projects work. Folks like the Tacoma Housing Authority know how to build mixed income housing. And I think they build a beautiful product, a very attractive product that I would want to live in. And I think everybody on this, on this telephone call will want to uh, live in. And so it does take public subsidy. Um, and that's what I want to encourage to serve folks who make below $57,000. Thank you. Jenny Hitchin. So I think we've had some really good ideas. Um, and I think if we could do all of them, we would have some things kind of figured out here in Pierce County. Um, I want to address um, veterans. And one of the things that doing some research, and it didn't come up in the, um, this particular report, but it, it could, the idea that if Pierce County had its own stock of homes available or units available, there's funds out there that are accessible with the federal government um, that we don't take advantage of. We, we literally don't do it here in Pierce County. And we know we have veterans living on the street. And so if Pierce County made the investment to have its own stock or work in partnership, more of a partnership with the Tacoma Housing Authority, where we actually had more units available, could we in fact make sure that we are taking advantage of these other forces, these matching funds, and bring them into our county so that we can get veterans off the street? I think that is one of the things that in my community is really important, and it's something the county's just not doing. It's not taking advantage of money that's there. Thank you. Okay, next question, Ryan Mello will be first. How do you think the COVID-19 pandemic has changed or should change the county's consideration of affordable housing policies and initiatives? Well, I, you know, the, the pandemic certainly has put a big, bright spotlight on the inequities that have existed long before COVID. So um, I think more people are being uh, made aware of those inequities policymakers and everyday folks who felt secure before COVID, who aren't so secure right now, um, are really seeing those inequities really firsthand and maybe for the first time. So um, that awareness is a good first step um, that there are really strong inequities that exist. And, and we got to, um, when we get out of the pandemic, um, and focused on that economic recovery, uh, we really got to make sure that we are focusing on um, middle class uh, families. That means investing in childcare specifically. Um, folks cannot go back to work without affordable childcare. But guess what? Childcare was an issue long before the pandemic. The pandemic has put a bright spotlight on the, the, the need and the lack of affordable safe childcare. Um, so that's just, that's one example. And there's a lot of other examples the county needs to invest in and help, help resolve. Thank you. Jenny Hitchin. So um, it's, it's not a surprise that we had so many people who were accessing um, the supports that were provided by the county and, and even some of the um, cities uh, when COVID hit as far as rent. And um, we have so many people in our community that truly do live paycheck to paycheck. And if one portion of their paycheck, if they were cut hours or lost a week, they're in jeopardy of losing their housing. So we have a housing stability issue with a huge portion of our population. And what I would like to do um, is really look at the data because we now have hard numbers. We actually have data of how many people access this. And then how do we plan for next time? And what do we do if? 
And I think we need to be making sure that we use this and we keep it in the back of our mind while we're doing policymaking, that we are creating safety nets like we had because of the federal money that came in. But what if it hadn't? What would these people have done? And I, our county would not have had an answer, really. I think we depended on the federal government, which is good. I mean, we should. But we should have had something in place. And I feel like that's something that we could have done because we know that we have a lot of people that work and live paycheck to paycheck in this county. Thank you. Jason Whalen. Again, a huge uh, question for a 60 second political soundbite. Uh, We're about to drop to 45 in a while, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a big deal because what COVID-19 has taught all of us is that we, no one is immune from economic disruption, uh, health disruption, mental health disruption. And so coming out of COVID, we have thankfully received millions of dollars in CARES Act funds that the county has distributed in any number of areas to address the issues uh, for our most vulnerable, including our small businesses, as well as folks in housing and uh, having uh, certainly health disruption and needs. So we have to recognize that this can happen again if we don't work our way out of it through good and better policy down the road. And that will include, uh, in my next 60 second soundbite, some significant discussion about how we make our economy much more resilient. Because we know coming through this that we've got uh, rent burdened families. And COVID-19 and the job losses made those rent burdened families even more burdened. We have to make sure that our economy is much more resilient for all spectrums of folks trying to earn a living here in Pierce County the next time around. Thank you. Okay, um, so here we are, and um, we're going to reverse the order. So Jason Whalen will answer first, so you can continue. Um, what are you expecting to happen when the governor's eviction moratorium expires, and what should the county do to prepare for it? Well, great question, because I live in this world, uh, both on the residential side as well as the commercial side. I uh, have done uh, a number of uh, evictions, both commercial and residential, in my 28 years as a lawyer in Pierce County. And I can tell you that there's probably going to be um, a, a bubble, if you will, of need to recover from the landlord's perspective, uh, either monies or housing. Uh, if those monies are not repaid. So we're going to have to take a look at it. The governor has provided certain guidance that nothing can happen until after October 15. The legislature passed uh, some laws last year to ensure that tenants have a better shake and ensuring that they have a longer span of time for notices of both default uh, for non-payment as well as for a month-to-month -month tenancy. Now they have to have 60 days in the event that someone's going to move so there are plans in place, but I think the county is probably going to have to look at having some more resiliency dollars at play for families that may be displaced because it's going to be challenging. I do have to tell you that the challenge, uh, while very grave and certainly real for many of the tenants, it's grave and real for many of the homeowners that have mortgages that have been unpaid as a result of the non-payment of rent. It's a challenge for all of us. Thank you. Jenny Hitchin. So excellent question and one that I think a lot of us have kind of been thinking about. Um, and I, one of the things that I really believe comes from the leadership of our county is, is those protections. And they did a really nice job at the state and the county level of bringing in supports. Um, but the what if is looming for everybody. What if and when? And we know it's coming. So what are we doing to make sure that we are sharing with both our, our landlords and our tenants about what their rights are, what protections they are. It couldn't happen at a worse time. Uh, so our county needs to be preparing now for emergency shelters and extended shelters across our community because if we have entire families that are being displaced, which we would hope that we could put a stop to it, but we know that that might not happen. So where are they going? During COVID, how do you socially distance in a shelter? How do you social distance um, in an emergency shelter um, or temporary shelter? And so we need to be working right now because when the winter comes and those, those drop dead dates come at the same time, that is when people are going to be at the most risk and are, we need to be working right now on that. Thank you. Brian Mello. Well, Liz, as you mentioned, we are recording this at the same time as the first presidential debate. And I certainly hope our presidential candidates are talking about this incredibly serious issue because the dam is going to burst um, when the moratorium, uh, moratoria at the federal and state level um, 
go away eventually. Um, the lack of a federal strategy to face COVID-19, this not only uh, is it on the public health side and the, the lack of adequate um, testing and, and data and, and, and public health investments um, and consistency of scientific information, but this is another example of the failure of a federal strategy um, because the, the, right, these mortgages are held in New York um, and, and other states. And as has been pointed out, um, if renters don't have uh, the money, to, if, if people who pay their mortgage, um, you know, mortgage holders don't have money to pay their mortgage, what are they gonna do? Um, and the, the bank wants to get paid. Um, and same on the, the rental side. So there, there's gotta be a coherent strategy bigger than Pierce County. Um, these banks are international banks. So yes, I'm glad about the tenant protections um, and the education of tenant protections, but I, this is a very, very serious issue. Thank you. So the order for this one is Jenny Hitchin, Ryan Mello, Jason Whalen, just to remind you. Um, how should and must the pandemic affect the county's spending priorities? So I think one of the things that um, became apparent is how dependent on schools the community was for um, handling their children. And, um, and we are not daycares, that is not the, the role of a school, but we need to be working very intentionally to provide supports when it became apparent that kids were not going back to school like normal. Um, and with numbers trending the way they are, even though the county and the health department had said we can start bringing kids back, I really wonder about that. And so, I think that we need to be looking at long-term situations. How can we increase access to some kind of childcare so people can continue to work? And I think the county could partner um, with community organizations and school districts to try and support that action. Um, it'd be a different way of thinking and a different way of looking, but we are in a very different world right now. We are doing this forum over Zoom and, and not in person. So we have to grapple with the fact that things have changed and be ready to make some kind of unique. Uh, and, and we just need to come up with solutions and be creative. Thank you, Brian Mello. Um, Liz, can I ask you to repeat the question? I apologize. Sure. How should and must the pandemic affect the county's spending priorities? Thank you. Um, well, you know, the, the pandemic is definitely going to, um, like we mentioned earlier in a previous question, it certainly shined a light on um, the, most, the most vulnerable in our community and our spending uh, priorities uh, definitely need to be able to help support those who are most vulnerable. Um, so. Uh, unfortunately, that's where I think uh, a, a lot, uh, I say unfortunately, because of course we want to spend our resources on other things, um, you know, beautifying our neighborhoods and, um, and parks and transportation systems and these sort of things that we know move our economy forward for everybody and make everybody's lives better. But we, we can't do that when we have hundreds and hundreds of people sleeping on the streets or sleeping in shelters. So uh, the pandemic is going to largely affect uh, spending priorities. We need to remain uh, flexible um, and not just wait to the next budget, right? We do two-year budgets now at Pierce County. We can't just wait two years while we watch everyone suffer. So we gotta be a lot more uh, flexible than I think we're used to because of the bow wave of the impacts that the, the pandemic is gonna continue to uh, cause um, months ahead. Thank you, Jason Whalen. Uh, how should and must the county change their spending priorities as a result of the pandemic in two ways. Number one, we have to have a coherent strategy on economic resilience and development so that when we come out of this, we have a much more resilient economy that works for all of Pierce County residents that provides better job opportunities, uh, jobs of the future that provide uh, better uh, wages so we don't have burdened uh, rent families. The other thing uh, that I think has been really interesting, I've done a lot of reading lately as a result of what's gone on with the COVID uh, pandemic, and there's an inextricable link between access to health care and GDP. So you've got a great Democratic thought and a Republican thought. If we provide better access to health care, we can enhance the GDP and the economy. One of those opportunities to provide better access to health care is to pass the one percent, one tenth of one percent for behavioral services in the county. That will provide access to better mental health care services which coming out of COVID are incredibly high right now as families are grappling with, as we've talked about, 
any number of stressors in their lives. That I think is a critical county spending priority that will help enhance the welfare, well-being and economic stability of the county. Thank you. For the next three questions, it will be 45 seconds each. I apologize. <clears throat> the order is Ryan Mello, Jason Whale, and Jenny Hitchin. <clears throat> Please state your views and the reasons for them of the following policy options. The first one is inclusionary zoning to require private developers to include affordable housing in their market rate projects in exchange for density bonuses and other considerations. Go. So let's remember that all of these questions we're going to get are very complicated public policy issues that I'm absolutely committed to hearing all sides and wrestling with data as the world changes. So um, th these aren't 45 second kinds of serious issues. Inclusionary zoning. Yes, I, in concept, I support inclusionary zoning. Uh, I think that if we're going to give something of public good away to the private sector to make more money, to make more profit, like more uh, more levels of development and say an apartment complex, I think the public deserves something in return. And that public good the public deserves in return is permanent affordable housing. Um, I think it's more than reasonable that if we give away uh, land use density, more height, more, more massive buildings, I think it's more than appropriate that the, the public gets affordable housing in return, not just lock, luxury apartments and luxury condos and more profits for um, for the folks who are wealthy. Thank you, Jason Whalen. Well, I think it's again a tough uh, a tough sell for the development community that's already having a hard time making the projects pencil at 20% if you're doing a 12-year a multifamily tax abatement project or an eight-year without the 20%. But inclusionary zoning mandates a certain percentage of low income housing. I think that's gonna be hard in the absence of other incentives, as Ryan indicated, that will make the project work. Density bonuses, I think, are interesting. I think they can work because it's a matter of making sure that the project has enough units to spread the cost over enough units sufficiently to recoup uh, the investment over time. So again, I think there is a give and take. And if uh, you know the council was inclined to pursue inclusionary zoning, they would have to include some analysis on how density bonuses can better attract and enhance the opportunity for a good project. Thank you, Jenny Hitchin. Um, so in kind of reading up on this and looking into this, um, my concern with the idea of a density bonus is the community that where we're putting in these like five or six or higher rise apartment complexes, is it going to impact them negatively? Um, and so I think if we're going to do bonuses, the county needs to be ready to make sure that any negativity that's going to come from, so like increased traffic so, or so people can't access um, getting to work. If they're going to provide bonuses where they don't have to do some of these things and we are going to negatively impact the community, we have got to make sure that we are following through as a county because the people that already live there are going to be dealing with in, in perpetuity. Like they are going to be there for a while. And we want to make sure that they can actually live there and be comfortable. Thank you. Okay, Jason Whelan is first. Incentive zoning that offers density bonuses, speedier permitting, and design flexibility to elicit the voluntary willingness of private developers to include affordable housing in their market rate projects. What, what, what part was the question? I'm sorry, Liz. Incentive zoning. Um, <clears throat> tell us your views. Well, I think incentive zoning can work, and I think the Burke study indicated that density bonus incentives uh, for the four projects that participated in the program, it, it worked in those instances throughout the county. And so again, you have to provide some incentive if you're looking at the private development community to make a project work. I've been involved in several uh, multifamily projects in Lakewood and some in Tacoma. And in the cities, unlike the county, we have the ability to have the multifamily tax credit as a development incentive. It has worked in Lakewood. It has worked in Tacoma. Um, there is one instance where it worked in the county and that's in my potential district uh, there in Parkland uh, with regard to Garfield Station. And they had to go to the legislature to get a change to allow that uh, residential target zone or target area to be established in order to get 
an eight-year multi, actually a 12-year multifamily tax credit abatement. Thank you. Can you hear um, so one of the things that um, I was looking at in that one is the idea of speedier permitting. Um, I just always want to make sure that when we are doing speedier permitting as, as an incentive, like it's, it's because construction world time is money. Every day you're not building, it costs you money. It absolutely does. And so we know that that is a huge incentive. If you can speed that process up, you can get those inspectors in, you can get those permits going quicker. So there's a huge incentive to do that. But I want to make sure that anything related to the environment and the public's opinion is also being um, not sped up. We need to make sure that people have the ability to comment and provide feedback. And we need to make sure that we're looking at our environmental protections. And so when I was reading the Burke report, I wasn't, I wanted to make sure that that was still going to happen. And I didn't see in detail which permits. And I, okay. Yeah, so. Ryan Mello. Um, I support these concepts and as has been stressed, the details matter and all of us can and should be able to talk for 20 minutes about these detailed land use policy topics because uh, that's what the county does a lot of is land use planning. Um, so in, in, this, in this question, I want to make also really clear, my previous answer on inclusionary zoning goes hand in hand with this question. I, I, I really believe that um, the, the previous question about inclusionary zoning, you can't uh, make someone do something if you're not going to give them a, a, something of public uh, good. In this case, we're talking about density bonuses. That makes sense to me. We're, if we're going to make your project more profitable, um, if, uh, you know, no developer is going to do a project if it's not profitable in the private sector. Um, so if they're going to get something of, of public good, then the public does need to be asking themselves, okay, well, what can the public get in exchange? And as we're talking about tonight, one of those great public goods is affordable housing. Thank you. Okay, Jenny Hitchin is first and views and the reasons for local tax funding, sales or property tax, for a local housing trust fund to help finance the development of affordable housing. So I think this is a really good idea when we talk about the idea of having access to a stock as a county of housing, um, using this idea I think would be a fantastic uh, first step. We don't have enough housing, especially that lower, so well below the 80, the 50, 40, 30%. We don't have enough there. And that's something that the private sector isn't really willing to help us. So it falls on um, our local community efforts and what the county can do. And we need to be um, looking at ways to do that. I, I think that is an excellent first step. I don't know if it would be a first step I'd want to take right away. Uh, I think we're going to be dealing with a lot of other issues at this time, but it definitely is something that we need to look at. And yeah. Thank you. Ryan Mello. Um, I, I uh, think that we need to be looking at different ways that we can um, definitely encourage the private marketplace and support our nonprofit developers. Uh, I think we need to um, be really great advocates to the legislature for progressive uh, funding options. We need to be able to bring more funding options uh, home to local government who, you, who are going to be using them on the ground um, in, order, uh, in order to help our development community build permanent affordable housing. Um, so, you know, I've learned in my time in public service, we have great, great relationships with our uh, state legislators. They listen to their local elected officials very well because we are the ones dealing with the the proper the, the problems when their session adjourns uh, every single day. And so we need to be advocating for the the tools like the financing tools right. to make these kinds of things happen in reality. Thank you, Jason Whalen. Uh, thank you. So I would look at local tax funding options at this time as a last or later. Uh, result. Here's why. We're coming out of COVID. Uh, we have economic disruption that we've experienced. Uh, taxpayers already have a very large chunk that was taken out of their budget as a result of the $54 billion with sound transit. It's hit the car tabs. It's hit property tax and sales tax. Those of us who are homeowners have all experienced a real increase in our property tax as a result of the change with the levy funding for uh, state education. And now we've heard me and others advocate for a one-tenth of one percent increase in the sales tax for mental health funding. So I think as Ryan indicated, we need to leverage the existing tools to the best of our ability first. 
including the new 1406 monies that were leveraged by the legislature this last session. And I think we can look at a lot of these options well before we look at another local tax funding opportunity. We have okay. to. Okay, we're going back to one minute. Ryan Mello will be first. And I'm glad you just mentioned the tax again, because the question is, there are two local option sales taxes available to Pierce County that have not yet been adopted. One is the one-tenth of 1% 1 for mental health, the other is the one-tenth of 1% 1 for housing. Each would generate millions of dollars annually to address these challenges, and each would cost taxpayers only one penny for each $10 they spend on taxable items. Do you support either or both of these? Why or why not? And if you support them, what will you do to try to get them implemented? Another question we could spend a long time on and should. Um, I'll try to be as clear as I can. Uh, one tenth of one percent for mental health. Absolutely, I support it. I'm going to do absolutely everything I can to uh, convince a supermajority of the county council to approve it. They should have done it 15 years ago, um, and I'm going to do everything I can to convince the county executive to sign into law. Um, too many people are hurting in our community, and that's been well documented. Um, the one tenth of one percent for affordable housing. I do not support that at this time. Uh, I. Uh, do support advocating for more progressive options, uh, different progressive taxation options that are much more progressive um, when it comes to getting more capital in place to help um, nonprofit developers build more permanent affordable housing. So I will be advocating for new and different tools in addition to the existing $1,406, which is a credit on the sales tax, not in addition to the sales tax, but a credit to existing sales tax that the state already takes. Instead of sending it to Olympia, we keep it here in Pierce County. Um, the mental health tax is gonna generate $14.5 million every year for really critical services. And I'm gonna fight as hard as I know how to pass that. Thank you. Jason Whalen. Well, if Ryan votes for me, if he lived in my district, he'd know I'd be a vote for that uh, one tenth of 1% for behavioral health services. So I hope to be able to advocate and be one of the supermajority that votes for that to make sure that it comes into play. I would ensure, however, as part of it, that we have good metrics and a plan to evaluate the services that are going to be provided through that 14 million of new revenue. And that would be very important for all of us as policymakers to ensure that the public is getting the best bang for their buck in our role as, as good stewards of the public trust. I do not support the uh, one-tenth of one percent for the, uh, the housing uh, tax option for the reasons I expressed earlier. I think we have to make good judgment calls. I think that if we're gonna choose the mental health tax, we can't also employ and uh, incur a greater tax on our public with regard to the, the housing trust fund. Uh, I hear Ryan talk about progressive options down in the legislature. I hope he's not talking about a, an income tax for the state of Washington. I don't think in my district that District 6 voters would be supportive of that. And so that wouldn't be on my uh, table for discussion. Thank you. Jenny Hitchin. Um, so I absolutely am for the one-tenth of one percent sales tax for mental health. Um, I have been since day one. Um, it was not um, something that um, even was a it just has to happen. We have too many wraparound services across our community that are not being dealt with. Um, and it's, it's hurting the community as a whole. Uh, and there's a lot of money that is essentially wasted when we are putting people in jail and we were using emergency rooms to handle the mentally ill. And so I think using the funds that we have um, through the one tenth of 1% for mental health um, is definitely something we need to look at. I think my answer before about the one tenth of 1% for housing, I think we still need to look at that, but again, not the time. But I think once we have the one tenth of 1% sales tax for mental health, looking at how that has worked and what it has done to people as far as the amount of money we're asking for, and knowing that that money would be used specifically for housing uh, for the, our most at risk, I think in the future, it definitely needs to be something we're looking at and saying no now. I'm, I'm not willing to do that. I'm willing to say we need to look at it. Thank you. We're trying to sneak in two more questions here. Jason Whalen will be first. And speaking of mental health, mental health issues are prominent in Pierce County. Although new facilities have been established, access to mental health treatment remains a significant issue. How would you address mental health services for Pierce County residents if elected to the County Council other than voting for the tax? Well, I think that uh, we are on the cusp of opening a new center in the 
uh, Parkland Spanaway area that will have additional beds to provide critical care uh, services for those suffering from mental health issues. We have one in Fife that's been very successful over the number of years. I think we can enhance uh, more and better access. We have the well-found uh, facility on uh, Union up there by Alan Moore that has been a collaborative partnership between the county and uh, some municipalities as well as some private enterprise. So we're increasing access to mental health services. We will certainly do better at providing access when we pass the one tenth and one percent for behavioral health funding. And uh, we are currently leveraging many of us. I know uh, the city of Lakewood does, as does the city of Tacoma. We invest one percent of our general fund for human services funding, including mental health funding as well. The other unique piece that Lakewood has done and the county is also doing in part is embedding mental health professionals within our, our police departments. And those folks are on the ground providing assessment and opportunities for conversations that lead to direct connection of folks in need to mental health services. And I think that's really uh, exciting work. Thank you. Um, where are we? Um, I believe Ryan Mel is next. No. Are we done? No, wait a minute. I'm sorry, I've just lost my mind. Who gets to answer now? Ryan, yes? I'll do my best. Okay, um, yeah, it's just you. In, in addition to the $14.5 million in dedicated mental health services, um, you, you know, our provider community, we have a lot of really great uh, providers, uh, service providers throughout our community who have um, really created a blueprint for how those dollars need to be invested. Um, there are already a study and a plan um, that's been produced. And, you know, it, again, it takes the, the public policymakers to stay true to that plan and not go chase the new shiny uh, pony. Uh, we, we know um, what's laid out in that plan and we got to um, resource it. You know, there's lots of people struggling. It's not just um, poor folks. There's folks of all income, um, all, all income levels throughout our community really suffering with mental health issues, right? Mental health issues don't know any um, income or political party or uh, race or, or, or anything. So we, we have work to do to make sure that everyone, that we, as, as public officials, we destigmatize um, mental health issues um, and really um, bring forward the many different opportunities uh, for access to care, no matter your income. A absolutely, folks in the lower income strata are definitely more, more pushed than, than others, absolutely. Thank you. And I apologize, Jenny Hitchin, it was your turn, so please speak oh, now. Well, I thought you were right. So, um, uh, so uh, Ryan, I really love the idea of destigmatizing the idea that mental health is um, because it is such a, a negative, if you seek services, you're weak somehow. And there's a, that is an absolute misconception. And, um, and part of it is that it becomes difficult to access care. So the one tenth of 1% is key, but once it's there, making sure that the services are getting beyond our cities, we need to get into unincorporated parts of Pierce County. We need to get to um, where we are indigenous communities. If that's something they wanna access, we need to make sure that we are actually working hand in hand with our partners across the entire county um, so that all have access that need it um, and, and that they feel comfortable accessing it because the quality of life for a family, if you have somebody who is dealing with mental illness, if they are in a deep depression, the entire family is impacted. Their ability to go to work, their ability to function. And so if we can provide them the, the resources so the family is stabilized, the good the outcome for that as far as the family as a whole, maybe they stay in their home, they keep their jobs, kids are going to school, and that's quality of life. Thank you. Okay, this will be the last question and Jenny Hitchin will answer it first. What can and should the county do to support and enhance transit services for affordable housing residents and people who are experiencing homelessness? Did you say transit services? The transit, yes. Okay, um, so I think that first and foremost, um, wherever we are growing, wherever we are increasing density, we need to be making sure that there's traffic flows that can get in and out of our communities. We have some um, areas that have been like blown up as far as the number of houses. And when you go and talk to voters in those area or when you talk to people that live there, um, people can't get out of their neighborhoods. And so as far as quality of life, no one's happy sitting in traffic, no one. It, it doesn't matter who you are. Like, 
nobody likes it. And so if we want to improve the quality of life and what's going on, we need to make sure that anywhere we're growing, that we are addressing transit. And that can be working on increasing our routes, um, the variety of routes, and making sure that people can actually get to the services um, that there's sidewalks and lighting in areas so that people can actually access our public transit system. Because we do have one, it just doesn't work as efficiently as it should. And that's something the county could be working with. Thank you. Brian Mello. We have a lot of work to do here and it really does impact um, disproportionately folks in the lower income uh, side of the ladder. Uh, but it really does affect everybody as Jenny just mentioned. Um, so right, right now we have a transit system that for the most part stops at 7 p.m. So if you wait tables or clean buildings for a living or at school late at night, you, you can't use the transit system. Um, it doesn't come frequently enough nearly around the county. Um, I'm, when I was on the Pierce Transit Board, um, I led the effort to uh, get a free bus pass for every Tacoma Public School student um, in the hands of every Tacoma Public School student and increase the amount of free passes to our social service agencies to give to their clients. I actually think we need to make our transit system free for everybody. Fares are only about 10% of the, of the general revenues for Pierce Transit. I think we can make the transit system more efficient and not have to have a whole collection mechanism, have more people utilize it because all of us are paying taxes already through sales tax, right? Pierce Transit is largely funded through sales tax. We're already paying for it. I think there's a way to make our transit system free for everybody and increase the frequency um, and convenience of it. Thank you. Jason Whalen. Uh, in addition to relooking how we uh, enhance and develop service hours for more residents, it's all about infrastructure to me in terms of the county's responsibility. The centers and corridors proposal that the county council is currently looking on is critical because we're all talking tonight about increasing housing. That's an opportunity to increase housing density in the urban areas of the county along existing transportation corridors, getting people from where they live to where they want to work. Number two, our policies should always encourage growth in terms of transit-oriented development. We talked about incentives for private development. The TOD, transit-oriented development districts, should be those districts that get more incentives for development because it's existing with existing transportation systems. Bus rapid transit, that is a incredible tool that we need to ensure is completed here in the county. I'm thankful to see that it's going to happen now in Pierce County as a result of the funding we've all contributed to over the course of time. It's gonna go out uh, to the Highway 7 area and I think that'll be a very successful uh, tool to ensure more reliability for public transportation and access for those who need it, deserve it, and want it. Thank you. Now it's time for closing statements. Each candidate has up to one minute. We reverse the order of opening statements and so begin with Jason Whalen. Very good. Well, thank you again for having all of us tonight. I was pleased to be part of this. I'm excited about being part of a thinking team. And I think, I think uh, we heard a lot of good thinking tonight. Uh, and I, I believe that I am one based on my experience, my background, one who can work collaboratively, who can seek the best ideas. Because as we often say in my years of experience in Lakewood, there aren't Republican potholes or Democratic potholes, there are potholes and we need to think the best ideas to fill them. It's the same with regard to transit, with regard to housing. We need to have good, skilled, experienced players in place in county government who can help facilitate good thinking to achieve the best results and that's what the county and its residents deserve. I'm proud of my many years of experience as a policymaker. I'm proud of my years of experience as a local attorney serving many, many small businesses and their families. And I'm also proud of my service as a veteran. Collectively, that body of experience for me uh, yields an opportunity to best serve uh, the county residents in District 6, because I believe from my perspective, my work for the last 20 some odd years has not been theoretical, it's been very real. And I look forward to bringing that experience to the County Council. Thank you. Johnny Hitchin. So thank you again for the fantastic questions and, and everything that we had the opportunity to discuss tonight. And there were some really amazing ideas. Um, I am 
very excited to have the opportunity to serve on um, Pierce County Council for District 6 because I believe that having my voice uh, as a woman, as a teacher, as an advocate for unions, and, um, and a science teacher to boot, we, we need to have somebody who is going to look at data and follow policies as they are set by our leaders on high um, and our leaders sitting at the same table. And we need to be making sure that we are very intentional about setting policies and following them as leaders. Uh, and that we are setting the bar and staying there. And so I believe that having somebody who understands how important policy and science are moving forward is going to be critical as we come out of COVID because the vaccine is not coming out, you know, in November, no matter what they say. Uh, and so we need to figure out how to get beyond what we are now and find the new normal. And I believe a science teacher can work with the community to build that relationship and move us forward. So thank you for this, this opportunity. Thank you. Ryan Mello. Well, thank you all of you and my fellow panelists. Thanks for a great discussion um, and uh, the ability to bounce around some really great ideas. You know, I, I'm known as a practical progressive. I'm known as a policymaker that takes on the tough issues of the day. I don't believe in slow walking the issues that are really impacting people's everyday lives, whether it's the need for criminal justice reform, um, the, the climate crisis that's in front of us, the drastic need for improved mental health services or more affordable housing. It, these issues need urgent action and serious action. We can't slow walk these issues. I've been tapped time and time again in my time on the Tacoma City Council and I want to bring that kind of energetic leadership to bring diverse interests together. I led on the Tacoma City Council to pass the mental health tax in Tacoma when the county wouldn't do it. I was tapped in Tacoma to lead the effort to pass the first affordable housing trust fund in the city of Tacoma. I was tapped in Tacoma to pass a climate emergency with a plan to address the climate crisis. We have really serious issues in front of us and we got to treat them urgently and roll up our sleeves and get to work. And that's what I'm ready to do. Thank you all so much for being here. These candidates are running for Pierce County Council, Districts 4 and 6. The candidates for District 6 are Jason Whalen and Jenny Hitchin. The candidates for District 4 are Javier Figueroa, who was unfortunately not able to attend, and Ryan Mello. You will receive your ballot in mid-October. Please put it in a Dropbox or mail it early, early, early. Election day is Tuesday, November 3rd. I would like to thank the timekeeper, Terry Baker, and the Voter Service Committee from the League of Women Voters of Tacoma Pierce County. Huge thanks to our event co-sponsor, the Tacoma Pierce County Affordable Housing Consortium, and our community sponsors, the AUW, Centro Latino, Eastside Neighborhood Advisory Council of Tacoma, Tacoma NAACP, St. Leo's Church, the Summit Waller Community Association, Tacoma South End Neighborhood Council, Tacoma Urban League, University of Washington Tacoma School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences, and the YWCA of Pierce County. <clears throat> please, watch, <clears throat> please watch for other forums, read your voters pamphlet, look up vote411.org, where you can find answers to questions posed to all candidates running for office in English and Spanish, read candidates' websites, and do all you can to be an educated voter. And having done all that, please don't forget to vote. Thank you, viewers, and thank you so much, candidates. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night.